morning. morning. Happy Pi Day to you. Did you guys forget? Some of you, maybe Dan over here knew it was Pi Day, 314, right? I wore green intentionally because I know this is an honorary group and I thought if I didn't wear green, somebody's liable to come up and pinch me in advance of St. Patty's Day. So this was intentional. I see some of you, most of you actually don't have green, so you guys weren't thinking in that. So maybe you're not as honorary as you look. Well, welcome. I want to start out with a question today. Are you satisfied? That's kind of a deep question. I'm talking about a satisfaction that doesn't change even when our circumstances are less than satisfactory. A satisfaction that's not dependent on external circumstances or relationships like our family, marriage, job, health, finances, church even, government, social issues, relationships with others. I'm really talking about a satisfaction in the deepest center of our heart and soul. So the question is, are you satisfied at your very core? Father in heaven, I just want to take this time. I'm grateful for all the people who came today, Father. This place is filled with your presence, with these people. I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be able to share this message. I pray that what I speak will be the words that you want spoken. Let us be filled with your love and your spirit, and let us go away rejuvenated and refreshed, just like the rain that you're bringing to us today. So I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start out by reading uh, a passage from John. It's in the video, John 4. And beginning in verse 3, we're going to read this section, not the full chapter, but a good bit of it, that speaks to the Samaritan woman. So as Greg Williams was talking about, this is a long exchange that Jesus has recorded in the Bible with this Samaritan woman. And then we're going to kind of unpack this. So he, Jesus, left Judea and went once more back to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank for, from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Anyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, swelling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I don't... Get, so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. Well, I have no husband, she replied. Yes, said, Jesus said to her, you are right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you have had five husbands. And the man you have, that the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, said the woman, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain 
nor in Jerusalem, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has come now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Jesus then, just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking to her? Then leaving her jar, water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. So let's look at these, this section of scripture here and start to kind of unpack it here because there's a lot of amazing things that maybe escape our attention as we go through this. So as we kind of re recall, Jesus asked for the drink. He asked her to go get her husband. The woman says, well, I've got this question about worship. And you know what? You're kind of a smart guy, but, you know, there's this other guy that I've heard of. He's pretty smart. So, you know, let me, uh, I, I, we'll wait to get kind of things settled when he comes. And then the Samaritan woman brings some others to Christ. So let's look at the setting here. So if we go back to John 4 and verse 3, and look at verses 3 through 6. So he left Judah, went back to Galilee. Now he went through Samaria. He came to Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. So Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. So let's just kind of get a little bit of a context here. So this is actually a long journey. As I was kind of looking at, doesn't tell us where he starts from, but we kind of get an idea of where he began, and we certainly know where he ends. He ends it here at Jacob's well. So kind of an estimated is that's about a 20-mile journey. So David can attest that's a long walk. It might have been even 30 miles. Now, he arrives at noon, so I would imagine they probably set out pretty early. But nonetheless, after that long of a distance, I don't know about you, but I'm going to be pretty tired. I'm going to be pretty thirsty. Uh, I'm going to probably be pretty hungry, and I'm ready to kind of sit down and rest and relax. So then we get to this next section in John 4, 7 and 8, and then things begin to shift. The story really gets interesting. So the Samaritan woman arrives. So she comes to get her water, and Jesus said, will you give me a drink? Because his disciples had gone to town to get food. I like what the New Living Translation uh, inserts it and says it in this way, which is kind of interesting. For some reason, the point needed to be made that he was alone. So the New Living Translation says, he was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy food. So let's unpack this a little bit. So Jesus is asking for a drink. What he doesn't say is, hi, my name is Jesus. I might introduce myself, right? Would you please give me a drink? No, he just says, will you give me a drink? So he's remained anonymous. I think that was very intentional. And I think we'll see that as we go along, what his intent and desire was. So then we have to ask the question, well, why is this woman coming at noon? And we heard in the video, this is a woman who, as we read later, uh, probably was not in the highest regard among the village or the community that she lived in. So if you think about it, if you're going to come and draw water, you're likely to probably come when it's cool, right? Because depending on how far you've got to walk, you'd want to do that in the cool of the day. So probably in the morning, maybe in the evening, although that can be a pretty hot part of the day. So here she comes at noon. It's just Jesus and it's just her. And it's likely 
And what we find here is that she probably would not have initiated any kind of conversation. Because as we're going to you know, hear, and we've already heard, but Jesus, this is the interesting thing, who initiates the conversation? Jesus does. And this is significant because, as we've heard, there was this rift between the Samaritans and the Jewish people. So this is the beginning of change, and this is a profound change that not just has impact for her, but we're going to find out it's going to have an impact for many. So what is Jesus doing? Jesus crosses the barriers of division. So, again, we noted that Jesus alone, so why is this even important to note? I'm going to come back to that, I think, in, a, in just a moment and address that. So then we read John 4 and 9. So the Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So this is a section I, I, I've, I've titled, You're Kidding Me. What? You're talking to me? This is like out of bounds and complete surprise. And as we read in verse 27 of the scripture where the disciples come, they come back and they are what? Astonished that Jesus is even talking to this woman. But I would imagine at this point, um, They'd seen some pretty astonishing things, but I don't know on the scale of 1 to 10, is this a 10? I almost imagine it's a 10, that uh, they discover him speaking to this woman. Because there, as I said, there was a lot of ill will between the Jews and the Samaritans. We're not talking about like a decade's worth of ill will or a century worth of ill will. We're talking centuries of ill will. So this has been going on for a long time. So if we think about centuries, I mean, if we look at the founding of the United States, we, don't, we have some centuries. We don't have like likely five centuries of kind of bad blood, so to speak, going on. And yet Jesus, let me go back, this, is port, this point is important. Jesus breaks barriers. He's not afraid to take the first step and to initiate. So, as we look at verse 10, here's this man of mystery. We still don't know who he is. That's captured her attention in this next section. And Jesus answered her. So remember, she asked the question, how can you ask me for a drink? And Jesus answered, I love this. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Let me kind of go back and, 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 and accentuate this. He said, if you knew who I was, you would have asked me. Instead of me asking you for a drink, you would have asked, would you give me a drink? But she didn't know who it was. This is, to me, what it's setting up is, is this important two points. God has an amazing gift for you. And what he wants you to do is ask him. But you've got to know who he is, right? She doesn't ask for the gift. So she's completely caught off guard. The second thing I want to emphasize here is you get a very strong indication that Jesus is saying, I'm someone you would like to know. So let's look at this next section of John chapter 4, verse 11 through 15. So then she replies, well, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his, also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks, water, uh, drinks this water will be thirsty again. But 
whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Let's look at this. There's something really interesting. There's a lot of, I think, interesting things here. And I don't want it to escape our attention. She makes this reference back to Jacob as well. And it's interesting that Peter would actually talk about Jacob in, in, in one of the scriptures. Jacob's well. I don't want you to lose the context here. So here is Jesus, right? Jacob's well. Jacob's well has been providing water to the community and to Jacob and his sons for about 2,000 years. We're not talking a hundred years, a, a millennia, about 2,000 years. That's a lot of life-giving, life-sustaining, keep you going in the moment every day for 2,000 years. So when she asks the question, are you greater than Jacob who built this well? And when we find out and he says, yes, we're not talking about a very small event. As a matter of fact, Jacob's well is still in existence. They actually, you can go to Jacob's well. And from what I understand and looking through some of the research, it's still giving water. That's 4,000 years. That's pretty amazing. So, Jesus presents this thing to her of the impossible from her point of view, but he makes it possible. She lacks Jesus' perspective. I would dare say we oftentimes probably lack perspective and we have a challenging time of understanding the viewpoint of God who is what? Spirit. I know I have the spirit, but there's a lot of physical in me, so I will admit, understanding the spirit of God and who and what he is, is a challenge. So I have a, a, a kind of, I want to plant uh, something. Have any of you been to Yosemite or seen pictures of Yosemite? Either one. Raise your hand. Okay, so most of you. So you would know that when you go into the valley, there's Yosemite Falls, right? Huge waterfall, one of the tallest waterfalls in the world. About a 2,000 foot drop. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but it is actually possible to drink the entire waterfall. It is. Emma, do you have a picture that you can bring up? <laughs> There is my son Kyle drinking the entire of Yosemite Falls at the rush. It's all about perception. Right? See? It's possible. Now that's an illusion, right? But when Jesus says it is possible, it's no illusion. It's not that. So, the other thing he says, you'll never thirst again. Eternal life is not an illusion. Now, even though she's asked for this living water, you kind of get the strong sense that she really doesn't understand what it is that she's asking. She's like, just give it to me, because I would be great if I didn't have to ever come back to this well and draw water. Let's turn our attention to this next section. I, th I think this is a, a fascinating section as well. So John 4, 16 through 18. So he told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right. Just when you say you have no husband, the fact is you have five husbands or have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What 
you have just said is quite true. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm having this conversation about living water and then all of a sudden I throw out this question, go get your husband. Well, that certainly came out of left field. I wasn't expecting you to ask me that question. So it began to make me think, well, what is the intent of Jesus asking this question? Because this is so out of left field that I am like, that's confusing. But you know what? The Samaritan woman plays along with him and answers the question, well, I have no husband. So I was kind of trying to unpack this and think of it from two viewpoints, from Jesus' viewpoint and from the Samaritan's viewpoint. So I don't know that this is, I didn't find it in any commentary, but I'm just going to hopefully not be too far off the mark. And Holy Spirit, hopefully I'm speaking some truth here because I do not want uh, uh, to be struck down with lightning. But here's something I think it's, is behind that question. Jesus, from Jesus' point of view, I believe, is asking the question, I am interested in you, not romantically, and your situation. Now, if you kind of know a little history about Jacob's well, um, Jacob meets what? or who, I should say, a woman, Rachel, who he ends up marrying. So there's something about wells, slightly maybe, right? Here we have Jesus alone, he meets this woman. I don't think it's anything like that, but what I do think is he's interested in her, so he asks the question. I don't know, if you were kind of a single person, this might be a very subtle way to find out, are you dating anybody, not dating anybody? Go get your husband. Oh no, I don't have a husband. Oh good, she's single. Okay, move on. I don't think it's that. All right. The second thing I think that's behind that Jesus' question is, is this. You won't find, this is a Samaritan, you won't find what you're looking for in your relationships. Not even your husband. But you will with me. And I think the third thing that he's doing here is this. I'm leading you closer to who I am. He still hasn't revealed who he is. Now, Jesus did something very profound. We're going to kind of read that. But he just told her, yes, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five. Now, I don't know if anybody who you came across as a complete stranger came up to you and told, shared something about your story that you're like, there's no way, I've never met this person. We're not talking this is a CIA kind of thing, right? That, that just really didn't exist. And share something about your past. That would really kind of, that would catch my attention. How do you know? For the Samaritan woman, maybe this could be construed. I don't want to carry it too far. But maybe this is a little bit of a romantic interest here, you know, from her vantage point. Because uh, we can kind of see she's got this thing with men that, uh, you know, kind of makes you wonder. Not saying that's entirely the case. The other thing is, though, she does respond truthfully. And the point I want to make here is that God wants us to respond in truth. So if he asks a question, if he wants to know, be honest with him. So, the other thing this is doing, again, like I said, this is leading us closer to Jesus' identity. So, let's look at John 14, 4, 19 through 24. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. So, and he says, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. And the New Living Translation, which I like, says this, The Father is looking for those who worship Him that way. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. 
So, we get an answer to a very long divided question between the Samaritans and the Jews around where is this place that we are supposed to worship. Is it here on this mountain? I think Gerzen is what it's called in that area. Or is it Jerusalem? But God says worship is not an isolated place. It's not one spot. Just as us coming here to worship is an, somewhat of an isolated a space. The other thing that we learn is that God wants us to worship in spirit and truth. He will find you. It tells us. He is looking. So if we are worshiping God in spirit and in truth, in a lot of ways, I don't know, as I was singing those songs, what was I doing? I was worshiping. I felt like I was in the presence of God. My heart was being filled. He is looking. He's not just standing off, sitting in some abstract space, looking down. He's actively looking. He wants us to be worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. So the more we become like Christ, the more we worship in spirit and in truth. So let's look at this next section. This is the section I, where we finally get to Him revealing Himself. And it's, and it's funny because the woman's like, well, that's pretty interesting. You know, that sounds pretty, uh, pretty solid here. You know, this thing about worship, that it's not just one place. But I don't know if I can fully get behind that. So she says this in verse 25. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. So you're a pretty smart guy, right? And that, what you just told me, that's pretty interesting because that's way different than what we've been arguing and fighting about. We've been arguing and fighting about this place or this place, and you just said worship is where? Anywhere? What? I don't know if I can buy into that fully, but I do know somebody, his name is Christ, or Messiah, and when he comes, he'll tell us everything. And then we're good to go. And I love this, because this is the whole setup, right? It goes back to, hmm, maybe that's probably why Jesus didn't tell her who he was, because she probably wouldn't have believed him. So we see this journey, this kind of evolution of this relationship from, what, you're talking to me? That was a big barrier divide. You mean you're going to actually step over here? That's like never been done before. And wow, you just told me I've had five husbands and the one I'm currently with is not my husband? That's pretty amazing. I'm, you're, I'm really curious about this. Hey, since uh, you're so smart, I've got this really deep theological question that I want you to answer for me. Where are we supposed to worship? Oh, what? Well, that wasn't what I was expecting. So, hmm, well, you've got me on all accounts that um, it's got me scratching my head. But you know what? There's this guy called Messiah. <laughs> Check it. You know, you can't be better than he is because he's going to tell us everything. And I love this. So then Jesus declared in verse 26, I'm the one you're speaking to. I am he. The New Living Translation says, I'm the Messiah. What? 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 What did you just I am the Messiah. I am the person that you are looking for who will answer everything. And thus far, have I answered everything that you asked me? Might have been not what you were expecting, but I have told you the truth. So here we get the ultimate authority to answering everything is sitting right next to her, the Messiah, Jesus. So here's this woman who has traveled to this well, who went from, I will say, empty to full. She didn't know that her day was going to be forever changed. She had no idea that she would also be changing 
the lives of a whole bunch of other people. God does work in mysterious ways. So let's look at this next section, empty the full. Jesus, John 4, 27 through 30. So just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But the, the disciples are pretty smart. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking to her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. And the New Living Translation has it this way. So the people came streaming from the village to see him. There are some interesting things that I, in my mind, that I, I want to share with you that I took away from this little passage. Why did she come to the well? She was there to get water. What happened? She left the water jar that she came to get water for behind. She left it. So what she experienced was greater than the water she came for to draw from that well. Then she goes and shares her experience with the people. He told me everything I have ever done. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was to go running to this, into this crowd right here and said, hey, I just met this guy, and you know what? He told me everything I have ever done. I don't know about you, but if there was an individual who could tell me everything I have ever done, I'm not sure I'm all that excited about having somebody reveal everything, the good and the bad. Think about it. Told me everything I have ever done. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, I'm probably maybe kind of thinking twice about getting out of my chair and going to see this man because that's a little scary. But here's the reality. The people came streaming. They came, they wanted to hear. To me, you know what this reveals about Jesus? When he reveals who you are, the good, and the bad, and he shares the truth, and you enter in that relationship from a, a standpoint of truth. What Jesus revealed was revealed in a way that created complete trust and safety in him. See, you're forgiven. And you're enough just as you are. I have this deep down conviction that this woman sensed that to her fullest core. Because if she's going to go and tell everybody, hey, here's this man I just met. He told me everything I have ever did. And guess what? I felt okay. I was in a safe place. I was filled with this amazing experience. I'm going to imagine love, compassion, humility, no judgment. And I want you to come and experience the same thing I just experienced. And the people came. Jesus is capable of filling the voids. This woman, I would imagine, had a lot of voids in her life. And yet, in a span of however long this conversation took, she went from coming to a well in the heat of the day with an empty water jar that she ended up leaving and going and telling about her experience 
completely filled and asking, come, you've got to come and experience what I've experienced. So the question comes back to us, are you satisfied? So what is the lesson for us to quench our spiritual thirst? I think there's a couple of four things I want to share with you. Who you were and who you are is not important. Your relationship and belief in Jesus is because through him, it allows him to remove the barriers, our sin, our issues, our differences. The other thing it does for us, it brings us, you and I, into relationship for eternity. I think the second thing it does for us when we look at what God wants from us to worship him in spirit and truth, to be in loving relationship with the Father, I think that speaks volumes because to really be in loving relationship with God the Father, he says, you have to worship me in spirit and in truth. Just like the songs that we sang, you know, they're worshipful. They're pointing us back to God and we're praising him. The third thing I think it does, and it speaks to me anyway, and hopefully it does to you, which is hard to kind of get my mind wrapped around, but the spiritual outweighs the physical. So we talked about the woman leaving her jar there and going and get people. She didn't get her water. Guess what? It's likely Jesus didn't get any water either. We never see in this section that Jesus got the water he asked for. And if you read through here, you see that the disciples are like, did he get something that we didn't know he had? Was he, did he have a cliff bar snuck somewhere in his backpack or an extra bottle of uh, crystal geyser? Because I don't recall him having any of those things. The last thing I think that's important for us to kind of take away from this is this. Share your encounters with Jesus with others. There are a lot of unsatisfied people waiting to know Jesus. Here's a woman who in her community who probably was not all that well regarded, but guess what? She changed lives, a lot of lives, because it says, Many believed. So this, as we kind of start to wrap this up, again, the woman leaves her water at the well with Jesus. She's returned to her community that shunned her. The water jar is not coming with her. She's probably letting go of some dead weights in her life once she gets home. And she seems to have had her thirst quenched setting her free from her repeated attempts of filling herself. She's let go of her desire to draw on her own satisfaction from the externals and instead becomes a blessing to others. Not only has she given Jesus a bucket in which to get a drink, but she joins him in his mission of evangelizing those in Samaria. She's no longer focused on herself. She has water welling up in her that is now overflowing to others. So through that discussion about worship, Jesus takes the opportunity to reveal to her his true identity, that he is the long-awaited Messiah. The woman's question about who is this man has, was finally answered. And in getting that answer, she found an answer to a lot of other questions related to, are you satisfied? So finally, in her long journey of searching, she has joyfully found a resounding yes to that question, and that yes came through being satisfied in Jesus. So now that she's in this new relationship, she's now accepted back into her community, 
as they listen to her words, they respond to her testimony, and Jesus is broken through the barriers for this woman and makes her a blessing to the community. You know, at the deepest center of our being, we are made for relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And it's a knowing and being known within the being of God that is so important to us. Because outside of that reality, all of our other pursuit, pursuits end in repeated disappointment and our thirst remains. So as we go back and we look at John 17, and I wanna kinda of close this out really almost in this prayer, John 17, 22 through 23, because this actually is a prayer. It's Jesus' prayer to God. He says, basically, God, I have given them the glory, you and I, you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity, complete satisfaction, that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. How satisfying a life is that? That God, Son, and the Father love us as much as they love one another. So as we wrap up, I wanna just share our challenge here. I want us to identify that area in our life that we are unsatisfied in and ask God to reveal what he wants to share with you. Because it's my belief, like the Samaritan woman who had this unsatisfied need physically, I think you will experience a very similar journey for her that she did. A journey into spiritual satisfaction. So with that, let's close in prayer. Heavenly God, you are the life-giving source for our spiritual life. And you've promised eternity to us. And yet that is such a difficult thing for us to enter into. I pray that as we daily seek to worship you in truth and in your spirit, that our life will be overflowing with joy and with love, that we cannot contain it, and that we will not only move past the physical, but we will take that and share it with others because your desire is that we have this unquenchable thirst that only comes through your Holy Spirit. I am just thankful for what Jesus has done for us. I pray that in this time that we're in right now, that every day will be a satisfied day, not physically, but spiritually, because that is so important to us experiencing you for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.